Hello and welcome to episode number 16 of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. Today is Sunday, September 21st, 2014. I'm Melissa Agnes, and this podcast is brought to you by Agnes Day. Let's talk crisis intelligence. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? I'm Jonathan Hemus. I'm the Managing Director of Insignia Communications. We are a UK-based reputation management and crisis communication specialist agency. Excellent. Thanks for for chatting with me, Jonathan. You're welcome. um, So when we were talking about this podcast and, and recording one together and you had a, a strong feeling or strong want to talk about the Malaysia Airlines two crises, two recent crises mm-hmm. from this year. And I thought that that was an excellent idea. So before I ask you uh, the first question, which I'm really excited to, or interested in hearing about, could you maybe just sum up for listeners the two crises that we're going to be discussing? Yeah, absolutely. I think almost without a doubt, certainly from a a business perspective, the Malaysia Airlines crises uh, of earlier this year, the two biggest incidents of 2014 so far. Firstly, of course, the disappearance of MH370. Clearly, the big challenge being that the aircraft has still not been found and so there is no closure and there is no certainty around what what happened so as we know a major incident of that size of, of that size is difficult to manage at the best of times but when you lack the critical bit of information as to what has happened clearly Malaysia Airlines and the other stakeholders involved faced an almost unprecedented challenge. And then, cruelest of all, when MH17 came down in the Ukraine as well more more recently, uh, all the evidence seems to be that it was shot down by a, a rocket from the ground. That just heaped agony on agony and an organization which was already doing its best to fight for its future was given a second major challenge and uh, clearly for Malaysia as a country, Malaysia Airlines as a business it's been a major challenge and I do believe there are learnings for other organizations who may never have to face anything quite that huge but nevertheless there are broader learnings coming out of it. We learn we learn the most valuable lessons from the biggest devastations, unfortunately. Absolutely. And it's all too easy, whether it's our own crisis or someone else's crisis, to move on too quickly. And I do think one of the most valuable ways of preventing or, or handling crises successfully is to properly analyze what's happened, what went wrong, what can we learn? And I say that very much applies to our own incidents as much as it does to looking outside of the organization. I absolutely agree. So you were recently in Malaysia. So yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about the vibe and and the sentiment of the locals and how they're doing and how they're just coming out of this. Yes. Well, I ran a crisis management course in Kuala Lumpur almost exactly a year ago, and we had 20 people on that that course. The course I ran uh, this August, we had twice as many people on that course, and I don't think there's any uh, accident in that. I think the events of earlier this year uh, has really focused attention on the topic of crisis management in Malaysia. But I was fascinated um, as someone who specialises in this area, to be in, in Malaysia at this time and to get a sense for the mood of the country. And it's a very poignant place to be at the moment. There are memorials uh, all over the place. There are, there, there are murals. There's still daily media coverage about the situations. Um, and there is a sense of uh, sadness there amongst uh, amongst people living in Kuala Lumpur. But what I also sensed, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, is that at a time of uh, adversity, actually it can also be a galvanizing uh, force. So 
I really felt a sense of um, dignity, uh, determination, and to an extent, pride. Um, and I was struck by how many people told me that they were determined to continue flying with, with Malaysia Airlines, for example, because they really feel that it's not the airline's fault what's, what's happened, that they're a good airline uh, manned by good people, uh, and that they almost had a, a, a national duty to support the airline. Um, the challenge, of course, is that whilst that uh, national passion and commitment exists w within Malaysia, further afield, uh, clearly emotions are still running very high, and people, I think, will continue to think twice about booking with the airline if they, if they have a choice. Okay. It's so interesting. It's, uh, I was actually really looking forward to hearing your, your take since I knew you were going to be there. Yeah. And I think, I mean, what's also interesting is that same sense of um, passion and comment is coming through via the various social media channels now. Malaysia Airlines own social media channels. They've made fantastic use of their own employees and Clearly, it was a devastating event for the employees of, of, of Malaysia Airlines. Uh, their colleagues had, had died, had perished in, this, uh, in, in, in these awful incidents. But I see what they're doing now on, on their YouTube channel is actually using everyday employees to tell their stories and how they feel. And it's, it resonates really strongly. There's genuine emotion there. And I think sometimes in a situation like this, getting regular employees to tell your stories for you rather than always the CEO or the man in a suit uh, is a powerful part of the recovery process. And uh, I think they're doing that very effectively at the moment. That's excellent. And actually, I, I completely agree with you. It's even proven in studies around the world that as consumers, we trust the CEOs and the executive teams less than we do the front line. And the front yeah. line, the employees, they're the people that, especially with social media and customer service being so you know, prevalent on social media, those are the people that we relate to. They're the yes. people that we have build relationships with when we're building a relationship with the brand who we communicate with. So that's a very important strategy yeah. that they're taking. Absolutely. I'll be linking to some of those videos uh, from this blog post because I think that's important to take a look at or from this podcast on, on the blog. Uh, so I have a question for you, and I, it's yes. a two-part question. So after MH370, so the first mm -hmm. tragedy that happened, many people were criticizing, especially in North America, many people were criticizing Malaysia Airlines uh, for the way that they managed and communicated throughout the crisis. However, few of these people really understood the impact that culture has in crisis management and the fact that we're talking about a country and a, in a completely different culture than North Americans on the other side of the world. So my question is two parts. So we have, I have, how do you feel as a crisis professional mm -hmm. uh, that Malaysia Airlines handled or managed the crisis of flight MH370? And the second part is what was the impact of culture and how did that affect their management of the crisis? Okay, so I think overall Malaysia Airlines did a really good job in managing this situation. It was a situation that was unprecedented. Uh, as I say, yes, we've had airline crashes, but we've not had airline crashes where the airplane has simply not been located. So I think this is uh, a crisis which would have challenged any organization and I think on the whole they did a really good job I think they used social media well uh, I think the chief executive as a as a spokesperson was a a good spokesperson um, and you know I think they I think they did the best under very very difficult circumstances uh, you're you're right um, culture plays a part and that's both uh, company culture and also national culture. So one has to remember that Malaysia Airlines is part owned by the government. So this is majority not majority owned, yeah. Ab absolutely. So this is not an autonomous business that can uh, just simply speak for itself without reference to the government. So uh, that 
complicates matter and you've got you've got the culture of the government and the culture of the organization and the culture of the whole the whole country and once again those those factors will help to uh slow down crisis communication and obviously bring the challenges of potentially mixed messages and who's responsible for what um but then yes opening it up more more broadly i think culture is a critically important element of how organizations and countries manage crises and expectations in one country can be very different to expectations in another country so for example i think in the uh, toyota recall from a couple of years back very big difference between the japanese culture and the north american and the western european culture and what's expected uh, in terms of how problems are dealt with and who's to say who's right or wrong but i think in this global world that we do live in now organizations do need to recognize that in the likelihood that many of their crises will play out on a global stage understanding how those events and how their reactions to those events will play out internationally needs to be part of their part of their thinking and part of their planning so important especially when you say that beautifully when you say that and i say it often as well that there's no such thing as a regional crisis anymore mm -hmm. everything has a global reach absolutely Absolutely. Uh, you, yeah, it's not so long ago that you could contain crises within uh, regional, uh, international, national even boundaries. That clearly is no longer the case. It isn't. So what are some good guidelines that organizations, because that's a big undertaking, especially when you're looking at different cultures. And so you have the, the culture of the organization, but then when you're looking at, okay, so if a crisis can affect us internationally on a global scale and in minutes, so in real time, how can organizations begin to plan for such a, an overwhelming task in crisis preparedness? So I think it will, it will vary from organization to organization. Some organizations, by the nature of their operations, truly are global and therefore need to plan for that. An airline is a very good example. If you're operating internationally, the incident itself can happen anywhere on any of your routes. And even if it happens nearer to home, then you will probably be, be carrying passengers from a range of different uh, countries. Um, you may not be in that situation. You may be in a situation whereby you operate in a number of different markets, but not truly globally. And I think it's about understanding where your key stakeholders lie. And as part of your planning, uh, understanding how the culture in your, in your own country may be perceived in some of the key countries where your stakeholders are based. So I think it's about us understanding what our natural culture would dictate in terms of crisis response and working out ahead of time whether that is likely to clash uh, or cause problems in some of the other markets in which we're likely to be operating or communicating. Excellent. Excellent. And um, so I agree with you, and I, I wrote a blog post at the time uh, of MH370 on Malaysia Airlines. Well, I, I obviously <laughs> targeted their use of social media and mobile technology for their crisis communications. Yeah. And I was, like you, very, I thought that they were doing a very good job at communicating in real time, at leveraging their different channels to make yeah. sure that communications went out, to make sure that um, information was easily found and also that you know, for example, their their Facebook and their Twitter mm -hmm. backgrounds went grey. Yes. Only their logo I think, was present. Absolutely. I, I think what's also interesting, and this happened with BP2, is for organisations now who are in crisis planning mode to look at exactly where Malaysia Airlines have ended up with, with regard to their online and social media presence. Because if you look at the uh, micro sites within their website now, they are 
fantastic. They have all of the statements there. They have uh, video postings. They have links to the other parties involved. They have phone numbers. They have all of the information that you could possibly want. Um, as you said, they quite rightly uh, had a dark site right at the beginning. But the interesting thing, I think, is for other organizations to look at where Malaysia Airlines have got to now, which I would say is pretty much best practice, and for other organizations to say, what do we need to do now so that it doesn't take us days or even weeks to get to that point early on in our crisis? And as I say, BP is another very good example. They actually ended up with a very, very good micro site during, during, during the Gulf oil spill, but it took them a month to get there. So let's take those learnings and let's get those uh, platforms in place and the resources available to get to best practice much quicker. It's, there's two things that I want to, um, I guess, address that you just said. First, before, hold on, yeah, before mm -hmm. I forget, <laughs> just yep. because what you said is so important, um, is that while dark sites on, we actually, I should, I should probably do a podcast on dark sites alone because they're so... They're very powerful, but there's a lot of misunderstanding or misconception about them. And they're, although they're really, really great for certain types of crises in certain industries, they're not needed for every industry, for every type of crisis. Mm -hmm. There are alternatives. So that, I guess, for listeners out there is going to be on my to-do list for adding a, a podcast on this subject because it's so important and it's so useful. Uh, secondly, you said and you're so right, which brings us into my but the next question I wanted to talk about, or the next topic I want to talk about, is that you you don't have you don't even you don't even have twenty four hours to set up something yeah. like a dark site if a dark site is needed, if that is gonna be if that strategically needs to be your home base in the crisis, never mind a month or a week or yeah. any other amount of time. So let's talk about the importance of getting the first 24 hours right in mm -hmm. a crisis. Absolutely. And I think the one big lesson which comes out of all crisis situations, and this is no different, is the absolute need to engage in planning, preparing, and training beforehand. Because as we all know, the speed of the world these days means that you are just not going to have time to grab hold of the situation and work out what you're going to do if you haven't done that planning, training, preparing beforehand. Um, actually, at the, um, at the training course I ran in Kuala Lumpur, it was one of the first things that delegates said to me in terms of their observations of what they'd seen was that they thought the response from the various parties w was was good but it was too slow and therefore they observed uh that the media and other stakeholders were going to other sources for information and of course many of those other sources didn't have credible reliable information they may have had a view but they uh, they didn't have the facts and they were not representing the, the key parties involved in that situation. And, you know, some of those, well, many of those old rules of crisis management still apply. You have to establish yourself as a go-to commentator on your own crisis. You have to be seen as credible. And by responding quickly, you not only do that, but you position yourself as being well organized which clearly is a valuable attribute to be demonstrating at a time of crisis absolutely i always find it so interesting that in a crisis people whether it's you know, the general public or your stakeholders no matter who we're talking about they look to the organization that's the crisis happened to or is at fault of the crisis, yeah. whatever the scenario is, they look to that organization first or to that, that, that leadership first. They don't immediately, we won't instinctively go as people to an external source or no. a third party source. However, so you do as organizations, you do have a window of opportunity to claim that yeah. leadership role. 
and to position yourself, as you said, as the credible source, primary source in the crisis. But that window is very small. Absolutely. And as you as you mentioned earlier, earlier on, Melissa, clearly the first place people are going to be going to these days is your online real estate. They will be going to your website, to your Facebook page, to your Twitter feed. That is the default place for large numbers of people to go to these days. So being able to flick the switch and to have the resource available to uh, man a you know hugely pressurized uh, Twitter feed at a time of intense pressure and scrutiny is absolutely crucial. Um, I think well, one of the other things, because preparation, training and planning, of course, is such a such a broad area but i think one of the other critical things that this uh well these two crises have really underlined is the need to work out beforehand who is responsible for communicating what and who is responsible for taking which actions in a situation where there are multiple stakeholders involved in responding to a crisis. So in this case, clearly the government and, um, and Malaysia Airlines were two of the key stakeholders who did both have a, a legitimate interest in, in communicating and acting at a more granular level, even within, let's say, more conventional businesses there will most likely be a head office based in what part of the world and there'll be a country office in a different part of the world, maybe where the crisis is, is happening. And I've seen it on a number of occasions whereby it's not been properly thought out ahead of time as to whether head office is going to have primacy and communication or the local office. And I just think it's so critical to thrash out those things beforehand, to discuss and agree in principle should something happen what's the role of the country office what's the role of head office and then when the when a situation happens to very quickly have a conversation that agrees okay this has happened now this is the role you're going to play this is the role that we're going to play because if you can get that right it avoids duplication of effort and uh, even even worse, it uh, it stops the real uh, killer in a, in a crisis, which is conflicting messages between um, key stakeholders. So important, and I'd add that you also not just your internal stakeholders yeah. and your your internal um, partners or, or yeah. collaborators, but also take a look at in what types of crisis scenarios do we have to work with third party organizations, yeah. whether that be government agencies, whether that be regulatory agencies, whether it be another crisis that affected or no, another company or organization that's affected mm -hmm. by the crisis or maybe responsible and have that set up. And we saw that with the Boston Marathon bombings. They did a really great job. Um, all of the government organizations that needed to work together, they did a really great job at working together. But one big piece of their communications that was determined to be lacking, I felt was lacking, was that they didn't have as simple as a common hashtag for mm -hmm. all of them to use together. So information is that's coming out from these different agencies are, it's harder to monitor. It's harder to, um, to, you know, assess and to make sure that you're not missing anything, not you as internal, you know, mm -hmm. internally, but also for external stakeholders who are trying to gather the pieces and the information in real time as they're coming out. I, I think that's absolutely right. I'd just endorse that. Identifying beforehand, understanding what the likely roles are during a crisis and building relationships beforehand with those uh, other stakeholders, the emergency services, law enforcement, etc., so that it's not a surprise when, when the crisis happened, it happens again. It's about working out beforehand so that you can uh, get operating quickly and effectively. I'd, I'd also say I think it's really important, though, that organizations don't uh, delegate responsibility for their reputation to any of these third parties. Sometimes when uh, a third party maybe has a slicker, better rehearsed uh, 
media relations capability, for example, it's easy for the organization that's affected to say, oh, well, that's great. We'll let them look after the communication and the media for us. Uh, the important thing, though, is that that third party protecting your reputation is not part of their remit or their or their objectives only you as the organization directly af affected have your own best interests at heart so uh, i think collaboration is is critically important with those other stakeholders uh, delegating or even abdicating responsibility to them for your reputation is not a smart move oh excellent addition i'd also add that uh, we to understand or before crisis, especially if you're working with different government agencies, understand their crisis communication language. So, mm -hmm. for example, government agencies uh, they deal with a lot, or they their crisis plan is built around ICS. So you have to understand the language of ICS. Yeah, if you're going to work with them. Um, in collaboration, but if you're going to work with them effectively, so that if they say the incident commander, you know what the role of the incident commander yeah. is, who that person is likely to be, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah, so many absolutely. important things. <laughs> so many important yeah. things to go through for crisis planning. But seriously, when we're looking at crises of this magnitude, like Malaysian Airlines, mm -hmm. we, they're so critical. Absolutely. And again, I guess building on that, we're, we're talking about stakeholders. One of the other uh, messages that came through loud and clear from the delegates on my course in, in Kuala Lumpur were that, you know, if an incident results in, in, in loss of life, your top priority must be to care for and communicate with the families of victims. And that was something that uh, was a challenge in the particularly in the MH370 uh, situation. But you know, any crisis plan, any organization which has the possibility of suffering a, a tragic crisis where people's lives are either lost or where there are serious injuries, really working out and understanding how you will care for and communicate with families, that's just so critical because firstly, clearly, it's the right thing to do. It's humanly the right thing to do. Um, but at a more practical level um you really don't want families being critical of you uh, in a crisis situation you want them to be well cared for and if asked you want them to be supportive of all the wonderful care that you're providing not being critical of the way that they're being treated and to add to that yes for your own reputation you want all of that but also looking at the humane side, the compassion side, especially sure. in a crisis like this, you want them, they're suffering. You yeah. want to make that suffering, you can't take that away, nothing you can do can do that, nothing you will do can do that, but you want to make any other relative suffering that could happen you want to take that away you you don't want to cause them any further problems on top of what is already clearly the very very worst day of their lives so yes i totally well concur with that absolutely so you uh, actually i have a question there was uh there was a lot of with the with mh370 one of the first points, I guess, of, of criticism for Malaysia Airlines was that they communicated via text message with the families of the victims. Yeah. So my understanding is that they tried to get to as many family members as possible directly, uh, either face to face or via telephone calls and then I think their judgment was for those that we can't get to we know this news is going to come out imminently anyway so we have to get that message to them as quickly as possible and text seems to be practically uh, the best way of doing that uh, you can understand that that thought process and uh, crisis management is often uh, not about perfect solutions but but the best solutions and the best judgments that can be made under intense pressure. I do think it's one of those situations where you have to consider 
uh, how the outside world is going to perceive that. And I also think it's one of those situations whereby if some elements of the communication have not gone perfectly, and we know that family liaison was an area of, of challenge, um, every subsequent step is going to be examined in 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 minute detail so i think i think malaysia airlines made the best decision they could at the time but i don't think it looked good for them i agree and i think that well not i think this underlines the need for establishing different stakeholder groups and how to communicate with them prior to experiencing a crisis. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. you have um, one, of, one of the points that we wanted to discuss was how a crisis focuses attention on subsequent, less serious issues encountered by an organization. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's interesting to perhaps consider briefly how what's happened before affects how the crisis plays out and then how the crisis then impacts what happens after the crisis because Malaysia Airlines was an organization already facing commercial uh, challenges going into this crisis which you know made the potential damage to the airline even even greater but then coming out of the crisis the world is is looking at the organization, focusing on the organization much more. Again, if I take a different example, first of all, again, Toyota, after their recall, there was far more news subsequently about every Toyota recall that followed than any other automotive manufacturer. Once your uh, name hits the headlines for a particular type of crisis, then the media in particular will be looking for patterns, repeat offences. And so I guess the first thing to say is, uh, if at all possible, you must do everything in your power not to have uh, a subsequent crisis because, you know, organisations can recover from a single crisis, particularly clearly if they're well managed. Two or three crises in quick succession are that much harder to handle so malaysia airlines has had you know a couple of relatively minor incidents where there was a perceived problem with the landing gear of a particular flight there was a perceived problem with 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 cabin air pressure on a particular flight that if they'd been any other airline probably wouldn't have even made local news but because they were already in the spotlight they made national and international news so recovering from the crisis but also being vigilant and knowing that you need to be absolutely on your guard and ready to respond and manage to what might in a normal uh, course of events be a, a minor incident i think is critical for crisis managers within organizations that have already had a big incident that's an excellent, excellent point. And, you know, it's, I think that it's one that after crisis you may think of, but it should be part of the crisis plan, the post-crisis plan to now, especially if you're dealing with a really, you know, big scale global crisis, especially mm -hmm. if tragedy is involved, to make part of the post-crisis to-do list another yeah. risk assessment. Where yeah. are we currently vulnerable, just like you just said, where yeah. typically maybe it wouldn't have made headlines, but now will just bring more negative attention to us? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. an excellent point. I think another slightly interrelated area that organizations uh, should be thinking about is during the crisis. As we talked about earlier, Melissa, one of the challenges uh, in this crisis, the biggest challenge was uh, a lack of closure and so whereas you know sometimes even big crises have a shelf life of two or three days this had a shelf life of week after week after week after week and i think one of the um one of the elements of crisis planning if an organization is unfortunate enough to find itself in such a situation is scenario planning during the crisis so as we know, there's a real danger of reacting to 
events and being driven by them rather than actively managing the crisis. I think that's particularly true where there are high levels of uncertainty and uh, very few facts to go on. And I think that is uh, a really important time to do some scenario planning, getting two or three members of the crisis management team or even people outside of the crisis management team to sit down in a quiet room somewhere else and work out what are the possible routes that this crisis could take and what can we do to avoid the worst case scenarios and steer back towards the best case scenarios. This, you know, this Jonathan just emphasizes the need for planning in advance because you cannot think about all of these important factors and important needs in a crisis in a crisis. Yeah. It it also uh emphasizes the need for regular exercises um absolutely no no exercise is going to uh put as much pressure on an organization as the crises we're talking about but nevertheless any organization that has to manage an event of anything like this magnitude wants to have done regular tests and exercises so that they are match fit to deal with a situation of this of this magnitude i say to my clients you know if you were a if you were an orchestra having to play on on a world stage in front of thousands tens of thousands millions of people watching you wouldn't do that without a rehearsal um there are still some organizations out there that are planning or not planning to do the same in the in the event of a of a crisis so rehearsals exercises training they are just so important that is an excellent analogy i like that one thank you <laughs> <laughs> so i asked you about uh, mh370 let's talk a little bit about mh17 so the second crisis that Malaysia Airlines went through how did you feel just how did you what do you think of the way that they managed that crisis and what about the criticism that this crisis could have been avoided I think um I think a couple of things I think the first thing to say is your heart has to go out to the organization to suffer a second crisis in such a short period of time and it's un- I this think one's even un- it's unimaginable exactly it is I- I- exactly that and uh, it's it's cruel i think cruel is the only only world world word for the same organization to suffer two such uh, major incidents so close together and this second one completely unimaginable unpredictable so that was a cruel twist of uh, fate i think Interestingly, but probably not surprisingly, I think Malaysia Airlines and the government really hit their stride very well in terms of the crisis management response. And it kind of comes back to what we were just talking about. They had the misfortune of the most intense uh, training and learning experience anyone could ever have the misfortune to endure with the MH370 situation and they clearly learned every lesson from that and so I think their response to MH17 was pretty much impeccable in terms of every step they took and everything that they did. I think they were also, um, in terms of how they were perceived, the fact that this came from outside of the organization and it was pretty clear pretty early on what appeared to have caused the crisis i think they very much were perceived as uh, a victim uh, in this situation rather than a villain of this situation and uh, i don't want to say that that helped them but i think you know, if this had quickly become apparent that this was uh, an act of negligence by the airline, then I think it might have played out differently. But uh, I don't think they put a foot wrong, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely true that 
even even when we do our our simulations with clients and we get a lot of it, you get a lot of exchange that has to go on between just in the development of the scenario stages of the exercise yeah. and often you get scenarios that the client thinks oh I think that we should touch on this scenario or this might be a good scenario and we often you'll look at it and say well you're actually if this scenario were to happen you're actually a victim within this crisis as well so yeah it's it's less and if you really want to test your crisis team you want to put all the cards against them absolutely i i yeah i totally agree likewise when we're running simulations we aim for a scenario where the organization at the very least could be perceived to be at fault or is at fault it, it makes it more challenging and again i always view that you know do your really hard work in training and testing and if the crisis itself actually turns out to be less challenging than the uh, training or the, or the exercise well that can only be a good thing absolutely all all the different layers of things to think about so you uh, recently did your crisis communications course in Malaysia mm-hmm. And you asked um, thirty. You had thirty-six delegates, I believe. Correct. Yeah. So you asked them to come up with, which I think is so interesting, because you're speaking with delegates in Malaysia, and you Absolutely. asked them to come up with their own list of five learnings from yeah. both MH370 and MH17. Yeah. I want to hear so, about them. Okay, so these are uh, the five learnings directly from those Malaysian delegates. Number one. When multiple parties are involved in responding to an incident, a clear understanding of their respective crisis management roles and responsibilities is essential. Number two. Well, let's let's just, I know that we kind of talked about it, but just because I often, well, thinking of myself listening to podcasts, I'm often in the car. (laughs) Yes. So let's just kind of briefly touch on each one so that it really Mm -hmm. sticks with with listeners and and goes into um, their conscious. (laughs) Absolutely. So we kind of touched on this one. It's so important. So let's just spend a a Mm -hmm. couple minutes touching on it just again. Yeah. So I think the message here is work out beforehand who those likely parties are and in this case the delegates were talking about the partners who would be responsible in responding to a situation not the external stakeholders so they were talking about the airline the government the emergency services the various parties involved in the response and their their view was that it's about and it's important to understand beforehand uh who will play what role and for that then as far as possible to be stuck with throughout the crisis so that it's very clear both within those group of people it also becomes very clear to the people watching on from the outside ah yes there's the airline they're going to be talking about this there's the government i understand they're responsible for that so it it clearly if done well helps to ensure consistency and clarity of messaging when you've got all of these various different parties involved. So important. It also protects against those misconceptions that can turn to judgment and rumors and negative headlines. So we know not to criticize the airline for not addressing this piece of information because we know the government, that's their role to address that. Absolutely. And I think establishing that externally very early on is is so important so that expectations are set. We know a lot of life and business is about expectation management. And if same in a crisis, if you can set those expectations early on, people are not surprised later on um, by how the thing plays out. So important. So number two. Number two, be ready, willing and able to communicate quickly, especially via social media, or else rumours will grow and speculative comment will be sourced from third parties. Now, this clearly is uh, a message that, you know, I learnt 20 years ago in crisis management school, not the social media bit, but the general message about filling the information vacuum but I did think it was interesting 
um, that delegates uh, from a culture where information is maybe slightly more controlled than in North America and in Western Europe, they recognized, very clearly recognized, that doesn't work. If you really want to uh, get yourself into, into the game, you have to communicate quickly you have to be prepared to do that that you must have felt for you as the the presenter of this of this course of this workshop that must have been a feeling of success to see that one on the list absolutely because i think uh if if you'd have asked their view on that six twelve months ago that wouldn't have that wouldn't have come through so uh yeah i think that is potentially you know something that will change the way that uh, organizations in that part of the world communicate in the event of crises in future and i want to say hopefully all over the world <laughs> yeah Not well just you're right there. you're you're right it's uh, yeah we're still encountering organizations that are very um unwilling to communicate early on and it's understandable there's a fear factor there's a uh, there's a hope that it will just go away but all of the evidence, of course, shows that it won't. And it only hurts you in the long run. Absolutely. Excellent. So number three. Number three, minimize the number of spokespeople and align their messaging to ensure clarity and consistency of communication. So this was um, a build on the understanding of roles and responsibilities, but the group felt that it was a uh, a specific point as well that – the spokesperson or spokespeople still are very much uh, the face of organizations in a crisis and that they play a significant role in how the organization as a whole is perceived. And they felt by uh, minimizing the number of spokespeople, you, redu- you reduced the, the, the potential for mixed messages. And to me, that is that is sound thinking. As we discussed, this was a situation which involved multiple stakeholders. And of course, all of those stakeholders have a right to speak. But the more voices you have, often the more confusing the messaging becomes. Absolutely. I would actually add to this one and say, you know, that... You have to also recognize and understand at the same time that every employee, every member of your team, every staff is also, whether wanted or not, like it or not, a spokesperson for the organization. So you have to recognize that and find a way to, prior to a crisis, obviously, and most importantly, but during the crisis, feed them information so that they know what, when, and how to respond, and when they aren't supposed to respond, how to refer those inquiries to the right spokesperson. Absolutely. No, you're, you're so right. And, uh, you know, we often train what we call the front line. So we train security guards, we train receptionists, we train switchboard operators because they are literally in the front line in a crisis situation and they can be your greatest allies as an organization, fantastic ambassadors, or they can be inadvertent spokespeople, maybe not communicating the right messages. So uh, that's, you know, a great point, Melissa. And I, I think it is something that Malaysia Airlines has now almost um, not institutionalized. But again, if, 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 if your listeners look at the YouTube channel, the authenticity of the cabin crew, for example, who are talking about how they feel and how they feel about their passengers, how they feel about their colleagues, how they feel about their organization. No one could fail to be uh, moved and influenced, as I say, by the authenticity and the the real genuineness and human emotion that those people are are communicating. It's a wonderful strategy. I'm definitely going to be linking to to those videos. People need to see that. Great. So number four. Number four, when an incident results in loss of life, your top priority must be to care for and communicate with the families of victims. Again, we spent three or four minutes talking about that earlier on, Melissa, but, um, you know, sometimes we talk about the theory of crisis management and we talk about plans 
ultimately crisis management is about people and doing the right thing for the people who are affected by a situation. And as we touched on earlier on, in a tragic incident like this, making sure that the families of the of, of the victims are cared for really, really well has to be your number one priority. And a good way to make sure that you will succeed in this very, very important part of your crisis communications is prior to a crisis, choose spokespeople that exude compassion naturally, mm-hmm. yeah. that are relatable, and that you feel confident that in a crisis they will be able, because the company or the organization can care, but your spokesperson may not have that quality of showing that compassion, for example. It might just be harder for them to do that as a human being. We're all different. We're all, when nobody's perfect. So, and then that, that compassion that the organization feels is lost somewhere in translation and isn't reflected properly. So Uh, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think the outside world in a crisis, if we really simplify it down, they're asking two questions about the organization. Are they competent and do they care? And you have to tick both boxes if you are to emerge from the from the situation unscathed. And caring is absolutely at least as important as proving yourself to be a competent organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. So excellent point. Number five. The impact of a crisis and how you are perceived to have managed it will be shaped by previous history and the context in which the incident occurs. So I think what this is saying is that crises do not happen in a vacuum. And so your history as an organization and the latest situation involving your business, your country, the world, they will all play a part in how your crisis plays out. I'd also broaden that out uh, slightly and it comes back I guess to the broader message about crisis planning I do think it's important to have built those relationships beforehand and to have built up a stock of trust beforehand so if you ever do have to deal with a situation uh, like this you have third parties who will be supportive who will understand everything your organization stands for and hopefully will be prepared to speak on your behalf um, during the crisis so um, there's a specific point that the delegates made but i broaden it out to that reputation and relationship building before the crisis absolutely i think it's really interesting that this was on their list it's so important and it's really interesting as you know somebody who wasn't wasn't present with them to see these five takeaways five learnings that that really touched and spoke to them through all of these well through both of these disastrous crises absolutely absolutely very interesting to to observe i think that well thank you so much jonathan for i think that this is such an important like you said at the start of this podcast these crises have a such a profound global reach and they're of such a unimaginable, unthinkable, unprecedented scale of tragedy that they're so important to di- dissect and to hopefully help organizations take very, very valuable lessons away from them. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do this with me. Where, you're, no, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm going to say you're, 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 you're very, very welcome. Where can everybody find and follow you? Okay, so uh, a couple of places on Twitter. Uh, you can get me via at J Hemus Insignia. That's J H E M U S Insignia. Or you can come to our website and take a look at our blog. That's www insigniacoms c-o-m-m-s dot com excellent and links to videos that you discussed or we discussed throughout this session this podcast and as well of course as uh, links to 
the your your Twitter and your website and your great blog will all be posted. No matter where you're listening to this podcast from, whether it's the Christ Intelligence blog, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher, you'll find those links below this podcast. So thank you so much, Jonathan, and I look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. We appreciate all of your support, so if you could share this podcast with colleagues, friends, or anybody that you think would benefit from listening to it, we'd really appreciate you doing so. Also, if you could head on over to iTunes and or Stitcher to leave us a review so that other people who are interested in listening to the podcast can hear directly from you on what to expect and what you think of the podcast, we would really appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions on topics of crisis communication that you'd like to hear us discuss, feel free to email us anytime at crisis at agnesday.com. Thank you so much for tuning in this week, and I look forward to talking even more crisis intelligence with you next Sunday. Mm-hmm.